joining us today. Uh, this is the next in our line of webinars brought to you by ESHA Research. My name is Ben Miller and I'm with my colleague Maya here. Uh, and today we're going to talk about the buzz on the FDA's definition of added sugars. Uh, before we get into the talk about added sugars, we're going to go a little bit about uh, ESHA research here. Uh, ESHA was established in 1981 with the goal of providing a comprehensive nutrition database with few missing values. Uh, we have solutions that include restaurant uh, labeling, uh, food labeling, of course, supplements, uh, nutrition and diet analysis software, and we have our consulting services department. Uh, the program we're going to look at today is, of course, Genesis R&D. Genesis was released in 1991. Uh, we have both the pre and post 2016 labeling formats currently in Genesis. Uh, Genesis is, is designed for product development, menu analysis, nutrient analysis, nutrient searching, reporting features, audit trails, uh, and can create labels for the United States, Canada, Mexico, and Europe. We have a few upcoming webinars that we have. Um, on June 20th, we're going to have our top Genesis R&D user tips for success, part one. Uh, and we're going to take you into the functionality, take your functionality to the next level. Uh, we have a lot of suggestions and questions that we got from uh, our user base over the last few months. And we're going to go into all of the questions that we had, uh, maybe uh, less commonly known things that Genesis can accomplish. Uh, on July 1st, we're going to have a Genesis R&D Supplements version 1.2 overview. During that webinar, we're going to take a look at the new functions and features of the Genesis Supplements application, demonstrate how to create labels for protein powders and fish oil tablets. And then on July 18th, we're going to have part two of that top user tips for success for the Genesis R&D food application. Uh, just a note. These webinars are recorded. They're available on our website and on YouTube. Um, and you can submit any questions using the GoToWebinar control panel. We'll get to as many of those questions as we can during the webinar. I'm now going to hand over uh, to my colleague Maya here, and she's going to go through all of the information on added sugars today. Awesome. Thank you, Ben. Really appreciate the intro as always. So welcome, guys. I hope you have your thinking caps on today and a big cup of coffee next year. We're going to get into some um, intense added sugar discussions. So um, this is definitely a huge topic as part of the new nutrition fact guidelines. And today we'll do our best to provide some additional understanding around the topic. We'll cover, of course, the definition, in, um, including some exemptions. We'll discuss BRICS values and how they relate to added sugars. Throughout much of the presentation, I will cover topics discussed in the draft guidance document put forth by the FDA in January. In the document, the FDA showed a few examples of how to calculate added sugar from fruit juice concentrate. I will go through one of those examples, one or two. Um, we'll also discuss added sugar as it pertains to hydrolysis, fermentation, non-enzymatic browning. We'll also discuss documentation, as this is still really a big, um, important topic in terms of when we have a combination of, of both naturally occurring and added sugars, documentation is very important. Um, and we will may still have a little bit of time for Q&A at the end. So thanks for joining us, as always. Reminder of the compliance date and timeline. So for companies that make greater than 10 million in annual food sales per year, um, they had the two years to make that transition. So July 26, 2018, as of that date, moving forward, um, anything that is produced on or after that date would be required to have the new label. And for companies that make less than the 10 million in annual food sales, they of course had the, um, the three years. And so July 26, 2019 will be the date that those guys are working against. A little bit of intro to added sugars. So added sugar is a new mandatory nutrient that is required to be shown under the total sugars heading on the label. It must state includes X grams added sugars. The recommended maximum daily value is 50 grams and that should be 10% of the total calories. Lab tests can test for total sugar content but cannot distinguish between added sugar and naturally occurring sugar. Here is the definition as put forth um, in the CFR. So we'll, let's sort of break this down here. We start with sugars that are either added during the processing of foods or packaged as such and includes sugars free, mono, and disaccharides. So those are going to be things in this area here. So raw sugar, brown sugar, cane sugar, fructose, glucose, um, all those types of uh, sugar 
sources are covered under that part of the definition. The next part of the definition says sugars from syrups. And so that would include things like honey, molasses, corn sweetener, um, high fructose corn syrup, uh, maple syrup, uh, things like that in the syrup form of, of the sugar source. And then the third piece, or one of the, the next piece here is, and sugar is concentrated from fruit or vegetable juices that are in excess of what would be expected from the same volume of 100% fruit or vegetable juice of the same type. And that last part often um, trips people up. In fact, it's quite a mouthful to say. And so we'll, we'll really try and break that down and think through how to calculate added sugars when it comes to fruit juice concentrate today. Um, here is an example of some types of sugars we find in our foods. So on the left, we have sugars that are a component of the whole foods. So when we eat these types of foods, they include sugar among uh, minerals, vitamins, fats, etc. Something like a sweet potato or a strawberry um, and milk. These are consistent with the idea of naturally occurring sugars. On the right, we see sugars that are consistent with the idea of added sugar, meaning when we eat these foods, the only contribution is towards sugar and carbohydrates, and therefore are considered empty calories, something like isolated lactose, brown sugar, and honey. In the middle, we have foods that contain both types of sugars. So a pumpkin pie might have some sugar from the pumpkin puree, and that would be considered naturally occurring. But, but the brown and white sugar in the pie are, of course, added sugar. Similarly, a smoothie contains naturally occurring sugar from fruit, but may also have some honey added to additionally sweeten the product. This is considered total sugar, which includes um, added sugar as well as the naturally occurring sugar. So just some sort of visuals to help us understand and set up the idea of added sugars. So remember from the definition, we saw that sugar is concentrated from fruit or vegetable juices that are in excess of what would be expected from the same volume of 100% fruit juice of the same type would be considered added sugar except, and so here are a few exemptions. Um, except from 100% juices sold to consumers. So something that we buy in the freezer section of the grocery store to make our own apple juice at home, that is not going to be considered, need to be labeled as added sugar because the idea is that the consumer is going to reconstitute that to 100% juice or less. Um, and there's directions on the label about how to do that. So that is the intent of how that's so supposed to be used. A couple other exemptions would be when fruit and vegetable juice concentrates used toward the total uh, juice percent label declaration used for brick standardization or used to formulate the fruit component of jellies, jams, preserves, or fruit spreads shall not be labeled as added sugars. So there are some exem exemptions listed there for you. Um, so the way the sort of the basic function of this is if I took some apple juice concentrate and I reconstituted it to 100% apple juice or less, that would not be considered using it as an added sugar. If, however, I took that apple juice concentrate and added it to any product when the sugar content exceeds the sugar of the same volume, the same type of juice concentrate, that would be considered added sugar. So what is above and beyond what would be found in 100% uh, fruit juice, anything that is in, in excess of that is the added sugar that we are trying to uh, calculate as well as document. So here we see an example of a product that could and couldn't have fruit juice concentrate added to it. Uh, let's see how this changes the total sugar content as well as the added sugar content. The cup total here is 100 grams, so I've got a 100 gram fruit cup. Uh, the first product on the left is made up of one-third each of diced peaches, diced pears, and diced pineapples. So I've got 33.33% of each of those items in the fruit cup. The second fruit cup on the right, um, part of the weight of the fruit has been replaced with 10% apple juice concentrate. So here I've got 30% diced peach, 30% diced pear, 30% diced pineapple, and then 10% apple juice concentrate to get me to 100% juice. Um, because this is 100 gram fruit cup, if I have 10% apple juice concentrate, uh, clearly I will have 10 grams of apple juice concentrate in this product. Um, in Genesis, we can use our spreadsheet report to understand exactly what is going on behind the scenes with our total and added sugars. So here I've got the spreadsheet report from the first fruit cup. You see I've got my peaches, pear, and pineapple listed. The sugar content, total sugar here is listed, 2.7 for the peaches, 2.35 for the pear, 3.28 for the pineapple, and zeros for all of the added sugar. 
So at the bottom here, we see we have 8.33 grams of total sugar with zero grams of added sugar. With the addition of the fruit juice concentrate at 46% sugar, so we know that our fruit juice concentrate contains 46% sugar, uh, something that our supplier provided us that information with. When we look at this spreadsheet now, we can see that this darker green ingredient here has added an additional 3.45 grams of added sugar to this product, which has increased the total sugar content to 12.13 excuse me, 12.1. Um, so that's how we sort of arrive at the math and we can use Genesis to understand how we're getting this information. Um, so I suggest working through some, ex uh, some example products on your own with your types of products and really using the spreadsheet report, breaking down the math so that it can help you understand um, sort of the math that's going on behind the scenes. Okay, so this is just, basically showing the same thing here on the left, that fruit cup contained eight grams of total sugar, zero grams of added sugar. When we um, replaced some of the weight with, we added the fruit juice concentrate to give it a little bit more sweetness, our totals went up to 12 grams of total sugar and three grams of added sugar. The 3.45 grams would round to three grams on the label. This is consistent with one of the examples the FDA provides in the draft guidance document for calculating added sugar. So if you know the sugar content of your concentrate, so here I've got sugar content of my concentrate is 46%, and you know the sugar content of your single strength juice, which would be 11.5, um, we can use do some, some math behind the scenes, and then we'll take the, the sugar in the concentrate, subtract the sugar in the single strength juice, and what will be left over will be the added sugar. So in our uh, scenario here, we have the quantity of the juice concentrate is 10 grams. So we take 10 times 46%, which gives us 4.6 grams of added sugar in the juice concentrate. We then take 11.5% sugar in the single strength juice, multiply that as well by 10 grams, so the same volume or the same weight here in this scenario, and we get the 1.15. So that's where our numbers come from, 4.6 grams of sugar in the concentrate, subtract 1.15 grams of sugar in the single strength juice, and we get 3.45 grams of added sugar. So that, that was also referenced in the draft um, guidance document as a way to calculate added sugar with fruit juice concentrates. Uh, bricks may come into play quite a bit in the draft guide. Bricks do come into play quite a bit in the draft guide guidance. And, and here's some basic info about degrees bricks as it pertains to the regulations. So degree, degrees bricks is the sugar content of an aqueous solution. One degree bricks is one gram of sucrose in 100 grams of solution. And this can be used to calculate added sugar uh, when using fruit juice concentrates. This is an excerpt from the minimum BRICS chart put out by the FDA. These numbers can be used for estimates of sugar content on single strength juices. We see that apple juice concentrate that we've been using uh, referenced at 11.5. And this can be found in 21 CFR 101.30 if you'd like to access that BRICS chart. Okay, so let's dive into one of the other examples the FDA put forth in the draft guidance document for calculating calculating added sugar from fruit juice concentrate. Here we have a juice blend consisting of apple juice concentrate, mango juice concentrate, and pear juice concentrate. So let's just start by collecting some information that we'll use throughout the next few slides um, calculating this added sugar. So we've got just our items listed here, and then we, we list next to them the sugar content of the concentrate. So each one we've been given by our supplier, 46% for the apple, 39 for the mango and 24% for the pear juice. The percent by weight of this in the formula, so we've got 10% apple juice concentrate, 10% mango, and 20% pear. And then we also uh, want to jot down or document the sugar content of the single strength juice uh, that we what would be in comparison. So um, using that minimum bricks table, we can see that apple juice concentrate would be 11.5% sugar um, if it was at a single strength juice. And again, this is going to be, um, this example is based on a 100 gram uh, serving. I'll keep going here. So this next area, um, 
and gets a little bit complicated, so bear with me here. The step two that we need to do is calculate the concentration factor. So the concentration factor is a factor of the final weight of the juice blend, if it were reconstituted to 100% juice, over the final weight of the actual reconstituted juice blend. Now, in order to get that, we need to kind of define some more terms. So B here, which is the final weight of the juice blend, if it were reconstituted to 100% juice, in order to get that information, we would take the grams of the juice concentrate in 100 grams, plus the grams of water needed to reconstitute to single strength juice. In order to get the grams of water needed to reconstitute to single strength juice, we would take grams of sugar from concentrate divided by the percent sugar in the single strength juice. So we do that step first. Then we subtract the weight of the juice concentrate in 100 grams. So those are sort of the, um, the complicated methods and formulas that you may need to calculate a concentration factor using this method. So step two will continue and we'll actually go ahead and calculate that concentration factor. So we know that A is, as we saw, is the actual weight of the juice blend. We know this is 100 grams. Um, and so this is, comes from when we're in the kitchen or in the lab, we're weighing it out and it is a, we know it's 100 grams. So A is 100 grams, so we need to solve for B. Um, so B here is going to be 40 plus 70, which is the grams of water needed to reconstitute to single strength, plus the weight of the juice in the concentrate, well, the weight of the juice concentrate in the blend. So again, the water needed to reconstitute plus the weight of the concentrate in the blend gives us 110 grams. So our concentration factor of B over A would be 110 divided by 100, which is 1.1. So our concentration factor is 1.1. Okay, step three, we need to calculate the sugar in the sugar strength, excuse me, the sugar in the single strength juice blend. Um, and we do this by taking the sugar from the concentrate, divide that by the concentration factor. So we get the total sugar from the juice concentrate by multiplying the weight of the juice concentrate in the blend times the sugar content in the concentrate. So we've got the weight here would be 10 grams times the percent sugar of that concentrate, 46% gives us 4.6 grams that the apple juice concentrate is contributing to the sugar. And we do that um, with the next two items and we arrive at 13.3 is our total weight of sugar from the concentrate, so total gram weight of sugar from the concentrate. We take that number and divide it by our concentration factor, which we've calculated on the previous slide, and we get 12.09 grams of sugar, and that is the sugar in the single strength juice blend. So then from here, all we need to do is calculate added sugar. So um, we take our 13.3, which is the total sugar coming from the concentrate, and we're gonna subtract the sugar in the single strength juice blend, which we just solved for. So 13.3 minus 12.09 equals 1.21 grams of added sugar per 100 grams. Step five would be adjusting this for the actual serving size. So you might remember these from math back in elementary school. Um, we need to solve for X. So when we'll go ahead and do 240 times 1.21 divided by 100, we get X equals 2.9 grams of added sugar per 240 grams, which is what we see in the draft guidance document put out by the FDA. Um, if you'd like some more information on getting through this inf uh, these types of calculations, please contact us. And let's move forward to talk a little bit about some of the other things mentioned in the draft guidance and um, as well as some questions that we've got in reference to this webinar. So mono and disaccharides, those are included in the definition of added sugar. So it's important, I think, to understand what those are. Uh, monosaccharides are the simplest carbohydrate and are often called single sugars. They are the building blocks from which all bigger carbohydrates are made. Things like fructose, galactose, and glucose are examples of monosaccharides. Disaccharides is a sugar or which is a carbohydrate composed of two monosaccharides. So sucrose, which is table sugar, is a combination of glucose and fructose. Lactose, which is milk sugar, is a combination of glucose and galactose, et cetera. So those are um, mono and disaccharides dissected. The next thing I wanna talk about would be hydrolysis. Um, and 
So if I do, I kind of want to start the same way, defining some terms. So hydrolysis is the chemical breakdown of a compound due to the reaction with water. Um, this is done in food processing for many reasons. Sometimes it can create a sweetening effect, although that may not be the intention. Um, another thing I want to uh, I want to define would be DP1 and DP2, and this refers to the degrees of polymerization. DE would be dextrose equivalency, which is a measure of the amount of reducing sugars present in a sugar product expressed as a percentage on a dry base relative to dextrose. So sort of in layman's terms, how sweet is this compared to dextrose as a relative basis? Well, why do these matter? Well, they relate to sweetness and sugar in your product and thus could relate to added sugar. We see over here that with the increase of dextrose, equivalent, of dextrose equivalency, DP, so the degree of polymerization is re reduced, which increases the perceived sweetness. So it's kind of a good relation way to remember how the relationship works between those three things. Of course, if we have perceived sweetness in our product, um, a consumer may assume that there is sugar involved in that, and so that's what we need to be concerned with. If we have perceived sweetness increasing in something that we are producing via hydrolysis, that may be a time when we need to document that as being an added sugar. I'll break this down a little bit more as best as I can. So when we uh, go through a hydrolysis process, it can create varying levels of mono and disaccharides with degrees of polymerization at one, and one or two. Um, some of these may contain, for example, 8 to 9% mono and disaccharides and can contribute to sweetness. So um, important to, if, if it is contributing to the sweetness in that regard, we would probably want to go ahead and mark that as an added sugar. Um, we do have a, a question out for the FDA in, in terms of really nailing down this definition, but this is our understanding as, as it stands today. Um, remember that rounding rules apply so that if Per serving, if you have less than 0.5 grams of added sugar, that can round to zero on your label. So even though your ingredient uh, singularly may not push your total past 0.5, the cumulative effect uh, may be that the, uh, your product per serving does need to be declared as added sugars because there could be a combination of added sugars occurring. How this pertains to the regulation. So, um, Many, uh, we need to be honest here. If you are purposefully using hydrolysis to produce a sweetening effect, this is considered using it as, as an added sugar. So whatever you're producing via that hydrolysis step should be documented as an added sugar. If, however, as an incidental byproduct, sugars are created during the hydrolysis step, the FDA and the draft guidance would not consider that added sugar as it would be captured in the total sugar value. Okay, we'll get into a little bit about maltodextrin and corn syrup solids. So this is where dextrose equivalents come in. Corn syrup solids have a DE greater than 20 and maltodextrin have a DE less than 20. This is our understanding again as it stands today and we're um, getting more information from the FDA. Maltodextrin itself is not considered an added sugar. However, depending on the level of mono and disaccharides, it may contribute to the sweetness as we've been talking about. Um, so one approach you could take here would be to not consider maltodextrous itself as a sweetener, but if you had a spec sheet and per 100, 100 grams on your spec sheet, the supplier provided you a four grams of sugar, um, you could record four grams of added sugar per 100 grams in Genesis. And that would be a way to capture the added sugar that may be coming from some of those mono and disaccharides produced via the hydrolysis process in maltodextrin and corn syrup solids. Purees, paste, um, let's talk a little bit about those. So in the draft guidance document, the FDA answered a question regarding purees and paste. Um, one thing to remember is that just because an ingredient is called puree or paste, it, it doesn't automatically exempt it from this definition. The FDA wants you as manufacturers to think about how the ingredient was created. So if it was simply taken in its whole form and ground down to a pulp and then cooked so some of the water was removed, that would be an exemption from the added sugar rule. However, if the ingredient was created by removing certain parts of the whole food, i.e. the skin or the pulp of the fruit or vegetable, that would no longer maintain the nutritive values you would find in the whole version of that food. So the main rule of thumb here is, does the ingredient maintain the nutritive integrity you would find in the whole food? If it's missing some of the other um, vitamins, minerals, et cetera, that may be coming because things have been removed from the ingredient, 
that would no longer mean that it's providing new, uh, a beneficial amount of nutrition to exempt it from the added sugar rule. Um, so there's not really a yes or a no, it's really exactly how your product is created. So I would reach out to your suppliers to um, determine that. Sugars after fermentation. So um, manufacturers need to document the amount of sugar being added to the initial formulation, as well as any methods used to determine final sugar levels. Um, it can be hard to define exactly how much sugar is left over, and so lab tests can be used to determine final sugar levels, and that can be used as the added sugar content. So non-enzymatic browning is also another um, process that is mentioned in the regulations. And let's first talk about what is enzymatic browning. So enzymatic browning is a chemical process which occurs in fruits and vegetables by the enzyme polyphenol oxidase. This results in browning pigmentation, something you see if you leave your apple out, um, it's going to get brown. So that's enzymatic browning that's occurring there. Non-enzymatic browning is a process that also produces the brown pigmentation in foods, but without the activity of enzymes. So the two most um, common forms of this would be caramelization and the Maillard reaction. So when we're creating some sort of brown browning on our food by usually applying heat to it, um, which is, creates the browning effect in the absence of enzymes. Similarly to fermentation, it can be difficult to predict the amount of sugars present after such processes as caramelization. So the FDA recommends in the draft guidance a lab test to determine final sugar content, which can be used as added sugar value. Documentation, as always, is required. Excuse me. And one last little note here on some one of these sort of one-off um, items. So let's talk about added sugar and lactose. And the example here that I would be looking at would be something like a dehydrated milk powder versus a purified lactose. So lactose is actually defined as a sweetener under CFR 168.22, which means that at, because it is defined as a sweetener, it is not exempt from the added sugar. Um, however, other dairy products, except for lactose, are not included in the definition of added sugar. So if I would have my dehydrated milk powder, that would not be considered added sugar. But if I took the lactose and purified it down, that is going to be considered added sugar. And it's already been defined as be, being a sweetener in 168.22. Manufacturers um, are required to make and keep really good documentation records to verify the mandatory declaration of added sugars, especially when a combination of both the naturally occurring and added sugars um, exists. So you need to be able to prove how we got to both the total sugar and the added sugar values. Um, so documentation as far as nutrition analysis records, supplier spec sheets, any mathematical calculations that you performed, um, lab analysis, those are all really important and required under the new CFR. I um, want to talk a little bit about what the ESHA database is doing and the ESHA team that manages the ESHA database. Uh, so we've populated as many items with added sugar as possible in the database and we've assigned um, ESHA codes to those. This is an ongoing process and data will continue to be populated in coming updates. Um, this includes We'll go through the list here. For ingredients defined as added sugars by the FDA, so sugars, the honey, the syrup, dextrose, we populated the added sugar value from the total sugar value in those cases. For whole food ingredients that contain naturally occurring sugars that are not considered added sugars, like the fruits and the vegetables, ESHA is populating the added sugar value with a zero. Data is being populated for mixed foods for which suppliers have indicated added sugar values, as well as foods whose added sugars content can clearly be determined as zero by ingredient statements. So when you get a, um, some of these spec sheets from your suppliers, a really good practice may be to always go through and look at the ingredients. And you're going to want to look at the ingredients and identify, are there any, is there anything in there that could be considered an added sugar? So anything we've mentioned today that would have, that has been on the list of added sugar, get out your highlighter and go through your ingredient statements and start to try and identify if you do find something that has um, ingredients that could be considered added sugar, then that's definitely a trigger to go back to your supplier and ask for more information. Um, at this time, if the added sugar data is unavailable or if it cannot be determined, we will lose, leave the, uh, that blank in our database. So you will want to go ahead and populate that as needed.
and we can do a, a save as on any Esha ingredient and put in your own added sugar values. Remember that this is a draft guidance document. Um, we wanted to talk about a little bit about what ESHA does in terms of draft guidance documents. So we monitor the draft gu guidance carefully. Uh, we do not implement draft guidance into our software programs until the FDA has finalized the guidance. Um, our goal is to provide solutions that follow the FDA's regulations and delay imp implementing compliance solutions that run the risk of changing when final documentation is published. At this time, ESHA is reviewing the most recent FDA draft guidance documents. Uh, we're consulting with the FDA with regards on how the draft guidance um, should be used, interpreted, and implemented in our software. And so we will certainly keep you up to date with any new info on that. <clears throat> we wanted to uh, talk a little bit about some helpful hints uh, and tips in Genesis that can, um, and then I'll show you some of these when, we, when I get into the program. Certain things like viewing your spreadsheet report. Firstly, we can view the spreadsheet report to look for any missing values. Um, so certainly if you are evaluating your added, uh, added sugar in your formula and you look at the spreadsheet report and see a missing value for added sugar, you know you will definitely need to attain that information. Um, it can also help, as we showed earlier, show sort of the math behind the scenes of how we arrive at our final numbers. We have something called the nutrient content search, and that is with an F5. Um, from here, we'll be able to search through our database for ingredients based on certain um, nutrition parameters. So we can say, let's search specifically for added sugars that are greater than or equal to zero, and that will show foods with added sugars that have been populated. Uh, we could do something similar, show us added sugar um, greater than zero, and that will show us all foods that contain added sugar that report added sugars so far. Well, you can also use uh, audit trails, reports, and notes. So at that, I think I'll jump over into Genesis for a bit. And we can start by opening up those two fruit cups that I was working with earlier. So I could go up to open recipe. I'll put in my fruit cup. I'll go ahead and open the first one. So as you can see here, this is the uh, fruit cup number one, which has the one third each of the peaches, the pears, and the pineapple. I'm gonna go ahead and open up also the second recipe. So open recipe. And this is the fruit cup with 10 grams of apple juice concentrate being added to it. And we can see the difference there. There's our, our second formula. Um, I want to go ahead and open up this apple juice concentrate here as an ingredient. So if I want to do that, once I have this highlighted, I can right click and go to open item. And that's going to open up that ingredient for me. I'll, I want to glance at the nutrients page and go down to sugar and added sugar. So you might remember from our fruit cup, um, we came up with per 10 grams of apple juice concentrate, it added 3.45 grams of added sugar to the product. So we took that number, multiplied times 100, this is on a 100 gram basis, so this is 100 grams of apple juice concentrate. When we multiply that by 3.45, we get 34.5 grams of added sugar. So we've populated our total sugar at 46%, which was given by our supplier. And then because of the math that we did, we found that per 100 grams, 34.5 of that would be considered added sugar because that would be what would be found in excess of the single strength item. So that's where we would go ahead and enter these in. We'll go ahead and close that out. And from here, I want to open those spreadsheet reports. First thing to remember when you're looking at reports is you may want to adjust your nutrients to view. So on the home screen, I can go to nutrients to view. And I want to look for something like the US label 2016 mandatory. That will bring up all of the nutrients required for the new panel. Once I have that selected, I'll go up to my reports page and choose spreadsheet, which is the first one on the left. From here, I can see the added sugar and the sugar values that I was looking at earlier. And we can go ahead and look at the same thing for the second fruit cup. So here's my recipe for the second fruit cup. Again, I'm in reports. I go to my spreadsheet report. 
And then I see that we have now added the 3.4 grams of added uh, sugar, and that bumps us up to 12.1. Uh, we can see how this would play out on the label as well. So once I go back to my fruit cup number one recipe, I'll go up to view label. I've already set this up, so um, you'll need to adjust your, do some things in edit label to create this. But here is our fruit cup number one showing eight grams of sugar, zero grams of added sugar. Go ahead with my fruit cup number two, and I can go ahead and view that label. And we see we have 12 grams of total sugar, includes three grams of added sugar. Wonderful. So one other thing that I wanted to show you would be that nutrient content search that I was mentioning earlier. I can access this by going file, open, ingredient. From this field here, I'm going to type in F5. When this little box comes up, we need to um, fill in some information. So I'll show you how I got this information populated. Go ahead and clear this so we can start from scratch. The first thing I wanna do is define which nutrient I'm interested in looking for. So from the select page here, I will choose added sugar. And I'll use the blue arrow to click it over. Hit okay. In the second field here is where I need to determine my parameters. So what I'm going to look for would be added sugar, which is greater than or equal to zero. So I have my greater than or equal to, and then the value we simply type in zero. Uh, we'll go ahead and hit search at this point. Oops, excuse me. Search, not select. And this will bring up everything in our database um, that has added sugars populated. So anything with a zero or above, you'll see all of the ingredients that have been populated in our database. Similarly, if we wanted to um, search perhaps a little bit more um, Perhaps you want to use this search as sort of a jumping off point. How did the ESHA database team go about populating some information? And can I use that as a starting point to sort of start to understand how my product plays into things? So I'm going to leave my parameters um, the same here. And at this point, I'm going to just go ahead and type in tomato. So say I was looking for something like a tomato paste. Um, I might work with tomato paste and I might not know exactly if that would count as added sugar or not. So I could use this nutrient content search, again, as a starting point. You'd certainly want to confirm and use other uh, sources to confirm this. But I could go ahead and hit search. And what I find is anything with tomato that has added sugar at a zero. Um, I see I've got uh, some tomato, and why don't I go ahead and put in tomato paste just to sort of clarify it a little bit more. We'll go back to my F5 search and put in paste after tomato. In here I'm given two different ingredients from our database, um, both supplier provided ingredient um, tomato paste. We show that we are calculating these tomato paste at zero grams of added sugar. So again, um, just a way to kind of start to understand how the ESHA database team may have gone about populating things. Um, again, please confirm with your supplier to make sure that that is in fact the case. Um, as far as documentation goes, we of course have the spreadsheet reports which are really useful in documenting any information. You'll notice that I actually have no missing values here, which is a great thing. If I did, I would see a little red dash and that would, inform us that we were missing some information. Um, I have a lot of good data here to prove exactly how I arrived at this item. So this is a really good document to keep on hand. Other ways to do use documentation in Genesis would be through audit trails, which essentially allows um, every time a user saves an item, it allows them to input a comment about what they did. It'll track the user, the date, and the time that the person saved, um, and then the person will need to put in information about what they did. If you would like help turning on your audit trails, you can contact support at esha.com. Also, in the recipe field and in the ingredients field, we have notes pages, three different notes pages. Um, so we encourage people to put in information such as the date, perhaps that you added the recipe, um, conf confirming added sugar. Whatever makes sense to you, but that is also an area that is available for you to document. Um, 
I wanted to show you one other report which may be useful in thinking through added sugar, and that would be the single nutrient report. So if I have my second fruit cup recipe open and I go to my single nutrient report, and I could choose added sugar. This shows me which ingredient is contributing to added sugar, and I can see all of my added sugar is coming from the fruit juice concentrate. Again, another great tool to keep in your um, files or your printout so that you have information on hand for documentation purposes. Okay, and with that, I'm going to head back over into our PowerPoint, and I will actually let Ben take it from here. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Maya. Um, if anyone else is, is feeling as unprepared as I am for these new regulations and added sugars, uh, we have some trainings coming up. Uh, we have an advanced Genesis workshop coming up in Las Vegas on June 22nd, 23rd. Um, that's going to cover advanced topics such as FDA labeling regulations, like we were talking about today, due diligence, documentation, and much, much more. Uh, on July 18th and 19th, we're going to have a Genesis Advance or a professional training, I'm sorry, professional training in Lombard, Illinois. Uh, that's going to cover the fundamentals of using the Genesis application. Uh, and then September 19th and 20th in, again, Lombard, Illinois, we're going to have another advanced Genesis workshop, uh, same as the first one, a new FDA regulations, due diligence documentation. Uh, if you have any questions or would like to attend any of those trainings, you can call our number uh, or email training at esha.com. We're going to go into a few questions here. Uh, note if we don't get to your questions either through the answer system in GoToWebinar um, or my answering them right now, uh, feel free to follow up with us. Send email to support at esha.com uh, or nutrition at esha.com. Uh, we'll answer any questions that you have. Uh, we also have a lot of helpful resources. We have our LinkedIn page, our blog, and our e-newsletter. Uh, and of course, all this information will be emailed out after this, the, the webinar and the slideshow. Uh, so jumping into our first question here, uh, which is one I think we hit on a little bit uh, earlier, but uh, when juice concentrate when juice concentrates are in excess of single strength, the additional amount is added sugars. Correct, Maya? Yep, you got it, Ben. Anything that's in excess would be considered added sugar. Perfect. Uh, we have another question here. How about tomato paste? How is tomato paste categorized? Uh, would the sugars be counted towards added sugars since it is uh, concentrated? Good question. And um, I did kind of cover that a bit, but definitely worth jumping into again. And remember that just because it says paste doesn't mean it necessarily uh, is exempt. It really means how was that produced? So if we just took the, that tomato and took out this, the stem and, you know, ground it down into a paste, we weren't adding any additional um, items and not taking away anything as the most important piece, um, the sugars in that are still inherent and they're among the other nutrition that the tomato place is going to be providing. So if, in that case, it would not be. But if it was combined with some sort of tomato concentrate um, that maybe didn't have uh, the whole food kind of um, as part of it, you, you would really need to dive into the details with the supplier. But um, in general, if it maintains the things you would find in the whole food, um, we can consider that exempt from the added sugars. Perfect. Thank you, Maya. Uh, we have our next, next question here. Uh, how do we properly enter the added sugar and dietary fiber new information into Genesis uh, from suppliers provided uh, that have provided nutritional information? And how do we better identify when that information provided from suppliers is sufficient or when we need to go back and ask for more information? And how should people be asking for that information from their suppliers? Well, that's a good question. There's about three questions in that. Let's see if we can get to them. Um, so firstly, how how you should be entering it into Genesis. Um, we, ha we have a lot of blogs on how to enter ingredient information, and we've covered this in other webinars. Um, so we could uh, you can contact us if you'd like information on that. Um, how do you know when the information is not enough? Well, you're really going to have to use use scrutiny all the time. Every single time you get a spec sheet, you should be scrutinizing that thing from top to bottom, making sure that it has 
that you feel sufficiently comfortable. Um, some trigger points could be things like, in a mixed product, the ingredient statement. So if you're seeing references to sugar or sucrose or molasses in the ingredient statement, you know that there is some ingredient in that product that could be contributing to added sugars. So definitely check your ingredient statements. Um, make sure that the, the math is adding up. You know, you would never want to see added sugar um, over total sugars. Um, so things like that. And then as far as how to ask for it, um, a great tool that we can provide is if your suppliers own Genesis, um, or even if they do not, they can use what we have at, an Excel template to imp uh, provide the nutrition information that you can then import into your Genesis system um, using Eshaport. So uh, that'd be, uh, Ben actually covered Eshaport. Great job a couple weeks ago on the webinar. So um, that is on our website if you'd like in additional info about that. Absolutely, that was a great one to, to look into. It was really designed to, to show you how to move data from your ingredient supplier into the manufacturer and vice versa. So uh, a great one for everyone to look into if you're looking for ways to move your data back and forth between ingredient supplier and manufacturer. Uh, next question here, uh, I'd like to find out the definition of sugar and added sugar and if the sugar in the subcomponents of an ingredient count. Uh, if it does count, does it mean we need to ask our raw material supplier to submit the percentage of added sugar in this ingredient? Yeah, um, so if there's sub-ingredients that would be considered added sugar, definitely something to go back and talk to them about. Um, again, that's sort of identifying in the ingredient statement anything that you might see. Um, and then, yes, something, and especially with uh, fruit juice concentrates, if you can get the percent sugar of the concentrate, you see how that can really aid us in calculating the added sugars. So hopefully once the supplier provided you with the information, they would also provide you the percent sugar of that. Perfect. Uh, a quick one here, is whey considered an added sugar? No, so whey would be um, considered sort of the whole food the same way we looked at uh, dehydrated milk uh, milk powder versus the lactose. So because the whey is still um, maintains what the nutrition and the qualities you'd find in the whole food, it would not be. But if the uh, the lactose was isolated from there, used perhaps with the intention of sweetening, um, then yes, that would be considered an added sugar. Perfect. Um, we have a question here about how to show something in Genesis. Um, if you're not seeing added sugars in your reports, uh, how do you adjust that? And, and of course, we all know nutrients to view is the answer, but you want to go a little bit more in detail with that, Maya? Thank you. Sure thing. Thanks, Ben. Let's see here. Let me hop back out. And Ben is right. That would be under our nutrients to view page. So I'll go ahead and show um, a spreadsheet report here. The nutrients to view will be on the home screen nutrients to view and let's just for the sake of showing this example I'll show you if we were to choose US label mandatory when the um, spreadsheet repopulates you'll notice that I don't see added sugar there and that's because it was not a mandatory nutrient in the old re regulations per the old label so I, I would just go back to my nutrients to view and choose um, US label 2016 mandatory in order to get that you can also always um, really personalize this in the modify tab if you'd like to create additional lists. Um, so that's how you get that, Ben. Fantastic. It uh, looks like one last question that we're going to be able to get to, uh, and this is more kind of a broad question about the regulations. Uh, what are the new font sizes and line requirements for the new regulations for the new label? Got it. Um, so we actually have a really great blog that references um, the regulations in regarding to font and font sizes, and that will be on our website, esha.com slash blog. Um, so that's a really good one to check out. Great. Um, as I mentioned before, if there are any questions that we didn't get to, or if you'd like to have a discussion with uh, our nutrition team or our support team, uh, go ahead and give us a call, send us an email, and we can help out with any of that. Thank you for joining us, and everyone have a great day.